So let me tell you about the first time I saw a girl turn into a gorilla. It was the summer of 1975, and I was having the day of my life at the Ohio State Fair, eating anything that was fried or on a stick, and riding anything that had the word whirl in its name. As the day came to an end, our parents let us kids explore on our own for an hour. So I began walking around, enjoying all the pretty lights and my newfound freedom. When I came upon a colorful carnival tent and this poster, promising me the chance to see a beautiful girl turn into a horrible gorilla, all before my very eyes. Beautiful girl, horrible gorilla, yeah, I want to see that. So I immediately bought a ticket and stepped inside the tent. Out stepped the master of ceremonies, who revealed a bikini-clad young woman inside of a steel cage. So I'm thinking, okay, this show's already worth the two bucks I just paid. But then he began to tell the tale of how the girl was the daughter of a mad scientist who had injected her with the DNA of a gorilla, and that she will turn from a beautiful girl to an angry beast if she hears the sounds of the jungle. He asked us if we wanted to see her transform into the beast, and if so, would we make animal sounds to simulate the jungle? Well, of course we did, so the tent filled with the sounds of the audience's best jungle impressions. Slowly in front of my very eyes, the girl began to change, growing hair everywhere as she got bigger in size. Within seconds, she was a full-fledged gorilla, pacing in the cage and shaking the bars. We were all dumbstruck at what we just saw, which years later I learned was accomplished through a simple Pepper's Ghost effect. But we quickly snapped out of it when the gorilla suddenly ripped out the bars of her cage and began running wildly through the tent toward the audience. I've never run so fast in my life as I bolted for the exit. I don't have a picture of me at that moment, but this is a pretty accurate representation. So if I'm you, I'm saying, okay, Sean, cute story, but what the heck does that have to do with trends and design? It is simply this. I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I vividly remember a carnival attraction I saw over 40 years ago. Why is that? Specifically, what attributes that attraction have that made it memorable, and are there any recent projects that share those same attributes? Well, let's see. It was bold. A mutant gorilla girl running amok in the tent is something you don't see every day. It told an interesting story. It was personal in that the audience was involved in the show. The tent itself created an atmosphere that immersed the audience in the story. And it employed a simple but effective technology that appeared magical in nature. I've come to believe that that recipe is why I remember an attraction from 1975 and a handful of the many attractions I've seen since. Whether it's the bold nature of Cirque du Soleil's Circus Without Animals, the heartbreaking manner in which the Holocaust Museum makes a tragic story personal, or the immersive nature of the city museum. The ones that really stand out to me are the attractions that have all these ingredients, including Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room and Tower of Terror, or Universal's Wizarding World of Harry Potter. So with that in mind, I set out to find recent projects that I think demonstrate how each of these ingredients can be used to create memorable attractions. So let's take a look. The dictionary defines a bold as showing an ability to take risks, being confident and courageous. But being bold doesn't mean you have to spend millions of dollars to create something brand new. Sometimes it can mean having the courage to try something a bit different, maybe even risky, within your existing facility. For example, most museums are open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and don't feature live bands, alcohol, and dancing. Well, the Guggenheim in New York isn't like most museums. Ten years ago, artist Agatha Snow hosted a 24-hour party inviting over 300 artists and creative types to dance in a loft in Lower Manhattan while she filmed the entire affair. This summer, Miss Snow resurrected the party in a different setting. Approximately 900 people were invited to spend 24 hours in the Guggenheim's landmark rotunda. Reliving a moment in time as Snow's film Stamina was projected onto the museum's walls. The film documented the artist's original 2005 party, which celebrated the resilience of the underground downtown culture of post-September 11th New York. The first live band went on at 8 p.m., and a revolving door of musical acts followed. At 4 a.m., the cash bar transitioned from cocktails to juice and croissants. Another example of being bold within an existing facility took place just a few weeks ago as the San Diego Padres swapped their infield dirt for putting greens, partnering with Callaway Golf to create the links at Petco Park, a nine-hole par-3 course within the confines of their home. The first tee places golfers at the park's home plate, with a batter's eye view of the stadium. From there, golfers walk through the Padres clubhouse up to various levels of the stadium to launch drives onto greens set up on the field of play. Putting greens were set up in the dugout and in the bullpen, while other holes on the course were themed, including a golf movies hole, where players had the option to tee off with hockey sticks like Happy Gilmore. 
The attention to detail is complete with real sand traps, piped in audio of birds chirping, and even polite gallery clapping. Originally scheduled to take place over three days, the first tee time sold out in three hours, so the event was extended to five days, meaning 1,600 golfers received a one-of-a-kind tour of a Major League Baseball stadium. I think a great example of being bold is to not accept the status quo, even if that means modifying the work of a star architect. This is the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati, designed by Zaha Hadid. And right about here is my office. I've toured museums in rural China, but since the CAC opened in 2003, I've never stepped foot in that building. Why? Well, frankly, the architecture, though stunning, was a bit cold and not very inviting. The CAC recognized that many Cincinnatians felt the same way, so they worked with local interior designer FRCH to reimagine the lobby of that building and turn it into a welcoming cafe and coffee bar. Now, at face value, that may not seem like a very bold thing. It's just a museum cafe, right? However, to modify a building hailed by the New York Times as the most important American building to be completed since the Cold War, just in order to be more inviting to your public, I think that's actually very bold. The lobby now features a full-service cafe, spacious lounge area, dynamic art installations, and a reimagined museum store. It's designed to align with the museum in both form and function, featuring artful equipment, and in keeping with the museum's rotating collection, features a new selection of coffee beans each week. Sometimes being bold means that you do whatever it takes to reach an audience. For example, the Charles M. Schultz Museum and Research Center in Santa Rosa, California, recently partnered with Sony Creative to establish the temporary Snoopy Museum, which will open in Tokyo this March. The museum will provide visitors who can't travel to the United States the ability to immerse themselves in the art and life of Charles Schultz. It will feature a rotating selection of Schultz's drawings and illustrations, vintage peanuts memorabilia, and other artifacts from the Research Center on a rotating six-month basis. The temporary facility is slated to operate for just two and a half years, and it is estimated to attract over 800,000 visitors annually. Some of the best examples of bold design occurs when something unexpected is created within a traditional visitor experience. For example, if I were to ask you where would be the best place to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math in or around San Francisco, what would you say? The Exploratorium? Well, that'd be a good choice, but an equally good choice would be the San Francisco 49ers Museum, within the NFL's Levi Stadium. Designed by Cambridge 7, the 49ers Museum is a two-level, 20,000 square foot space dedicated to showcasing the past, present, and future of the 49ers organization. In addition to featuring a number of theaters, galleries, and interactives, the 49ers Museum features an innovative STEM education program that uses football as a platform for teaching content-rich lessons in STEM to visiting school groups. The program consists of three parts, a tour of the stadium, a tour of the museum, and a lesson in the STEM Education Center. Designed for students from kindergarten to eighth grade, the program leverages the student's interest in football as a basis for content and uses a variety of leading edge technological tools and techniques to teach STEM principles in a completely new and exciting way. By the time their field trip concludes, the students are able to understand the vital role that STEM plays in the game of football and in our modern world. The program has been very popular and in response is doubling its current capacity from 30,000 students to 60,000 students next year. A traditional nature center often provides guests with a museum style visitor center coupled with adjacent walking trails. And since its opening in 2005, the Wild Center near Lake Placid, New York has done just that, combining traditional museum displays, multimedia presentations, live animal exhibits, and nature trails to educate guests about the natural beauty of the six million acre Adirondack Park in which it resides. This past July, the center launched a new project to give visitors a new perspective on the park, transforming 84 tons of steel into an elevated Adirondack adventure. Designed by Chip Ray, the new Wild Walk invites guests to travel 40 feet above the ground on a quarter mile, fully accessible trip over bridges and platforms across the Adirondack treetops, where they can walk into the inside of a dead tree, explore a spider's web perched 24 feet off the ground, or imagine life as an eagle by gazing down from an oversized bird's nest. The intent of Wild Walk is to change the way guests look at the forest by seeing it from the perspective of the animals who live there. The project has been a huge success. Wild Walk opened this July 4th of this year and attracted over 50,000 guests in that month alone. The next ingredient in our recipe of creating a memorable attraction is to tell a compelling story. But what if that story has been told over and over again for well over a hundred years in history books, museums, documentaries, television, and movies, 
How do you keep that story fresh? Well, that story is the life of Abraham Lincoln, and the Lincoln Heritage, Mu Heritage Museum in Nebraska is telling that story in a very interesting manner. Those who've had near-death experiences often mention that they saw their entire life pass before them, as if in a dream. This has been called a life review. This is the premise of the Lincoln Heritage Museum's new core exhibit designed by Taylor Studios. Beginning with, pre beginning with President Lincoln's assassination, visitors walk with President Lincoln as he experiences a life review during the nine hours after he was shot until the time he died. The exhibit environment takes on the aesthetic of a dreamscape, and visitors are free to reach out and touch any aspect of the dream setting, as Lincoln does in his dream. Brightly colored objects in the grayscale scenes initiate the life review vignettes. Individual objects are illuminated, indicating to guests that is an item that can be touched. Touching objects unlock Lincoln's memories using surround sound, lighting effects, and projection. As Lincoln moves from experience to experience in different rooms, a breeze-like swoosh prompts visitors to move with him to the next room. By telling the story from Lincoln's perspective, the exhibit creates a more personal, human, and emotional experience for guests, bringing a well-known story to life. Sometimes a fictional story can have as much, if not more, staying power than a true tale. For example, I doubt there's anyone who doesn't know this hit song by ABBA. which was turned into a hit musical, which itself was adapted into a smash motion picture. Although the Broadway show closed this year after 14 years on stage, Mamma Mia! The Musical is getting a rebirth of sorts, as the first ever ABBA-themed restaurant will open this January in Stockholm. Created by former ABBA singer Bjorn Julvius, the Mamma Mia!-inspired eatery will be located next to the popular ABBA Museum. Part restaurant, part stage show, part role play, all focusing on inter audience interaction. The eatery will be fashioned as a Greek island tavern, where the story is set. Guests will be able to become the stars of their own personal version of Mamma Mia, which will change night to night depending on how the audience reacts. Today's audiences not only appreciate a personalized experience, they are coming to expect it. One of the best recent examples of a personalized experience can be found within the new College Football Hall of Fame located in Atlanta, where Cortina Productions in collaboration with Gallagher Associates, BBI Engineering, Stark RFID, and Pacific Studios have provided fans with an entirely custom experience that is centered on them and their favorite college football team. Here's a short video. Welcome to the new College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia. The most personalized and shareable sports museum in the world. At ticketing, you receive your all-access pass. It's worn on a lanyard, similar to what you might see on the sidelines of a big game but each is embedded with an RFID chip that activates experiences throughout the hall, allowing for a personalized visit catered to each and every fan. Upon entering the hall, you register your all-access pass and choose to represent one of the over 765 schools that play college football. Once you've registered, your school's helmet immediately lights up on the helmet wall and will stay lit while you're in the building. You can stay with your selected school for your entire visit or change to another school at any time. From there, it's on to the exhibits. The interactive exhibits recognize you as you approach, they greet you by name, and they activate without you even needing to touch the screen. Experiences throughout the hall will present you with content tailored to your school, like video and photographs, your championship history, your rivals, and your Hall of Famers. You can play mini games at the Fans Game Day Challenge, earning points for your school. Get your team to the championship. Perform your fight song. Paint your face. Pick a winner at the game day desk. Well, that's a no brainer. I'm picking my Lakers all the way. Leave your comments on why you love college football. Earn achievements and check your progress at any interactive throughout your experience. User generated content like videos, photos, and audio are pushed to your own personal profile page at cfbhall.com and can immediately be accessed on your smartphone or computer and shared to your social media sites. 
The All Access Pass is an integrated system with ticketing, building intelligence, and content. Your call has been saved to your All Access Pass. <laughs> the whole system is powered by custom software, a global content management system, and software show control. The results have been amazing. When we were in the planning stages for the building, we were told that we'd be lucky to get 20% of our guests that would choose to register for their All Access Pass. We've been very pleasantly surprised. It's hovering between 85 and 90% of our guests, and they've created hundreds of thousands of pieces of shareable content that have been uploaded to the web since you've been open. Touchdown FC! Here at the new College Football Hall of Fame, content and cutting edge technology come together to bring the visitor closer to the game day experience than ever before. Some of my favorite museums are those that immerse you within their subject matter. But when dealing with culturally significant historic sites, how do you balance preservation with providing guest access? The Megawa Caves, also known as the Thousand Buddha Caves, were carved out of a hillside in the Gobi Desert over a period of a thousand years. About 26,000 people visited the caves when the site opened to the public in 1979. In 2014, that number reached 1 million. Unfortunately, the amount of humidity and carbon dioxide related to this influx of tourism began to deteriorate the art in the cave walls. So archaeologists in charge of the site submitted a proposal to the government for a visitor center that would let people experience the cave with minimal access. The plan was approved and last year a new $50 million visitor center opened. The center aims to give visitors a more immersive experience while reducing the amount of time they actually spend in the caves. So the archaeologists, the archaeologists went into the site and scanned all the caves and paintings. This data was then turned into a 20-minute domed film within the museum as well as a traveling exhibit that allows visitors to view the caves in a virtual manner that remains authentic. One of my favorite more recent immersive experiences only lasts 47 seconds. This past May, the highly anticipated One World Trade Center opened in Manhattan with its innovative observation deck experience designed by the head of the group. The five elevators that service the deck are the fastest elevators in North America, traveling from the basement to the 102nd floor in 47 seconds. While the speed is great for operations, it doesn't provide a lot of time for a pre-show experience. The challenge is, was how to create something meaningful for guests, providing context for what they're about to see in less than 50 seconds. The answer was to configure nine 75-inch high-definition monitors in each cab to convey the impression that guests are traveling within a glass-walled elevator. As guests travel to the observation level, they are immersed within a beautiful time-lapse animation created by Blur Studio which recreates the development of New York City skyline from the 1500s to the present. This magical media presentation elegantly tells many stories in a short period of time, including natural history and cultural history. As you watch the following video, watch the timeline graphic and notice how the designers subtly show the rise and tragic fall of the former World Trade Center, which stood adjacent to the site from 1973 to 2001. British science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke famously stated that any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The next project illustrates how advanced algorithms and projection technology can be combined to convey an important historical lesson in a way that guests will never forget. This summer, the Illinois Holocaust Museum tested new dimensions in testimony, an interactive educational experience that allows future generations to talk with Holocaust survivors about their life experiences. The prototype was a holographic representation of Holocaust survivor Pinkas Guttar. After answering 1,800 questions about his experience surrounded by lights and cameras, a Siri-like artificial intelligence system was used to create an exhibit where museum guests were able to converse with Guttar. Well, actually, a virtual Guttar. Let's take a look. Meet Pinkas Guttar, an 83-year-old man whose life story and experiences through the Holocaust is breaking new ground in technology. 
When the family arrived at Majdanek, Pincus's parents and his sister were sent immediately to the gas chamber. Pincus was selected for work. Pincus was 11 when his family was killed. He survived by lying about his age. I stuck to my father like glue, and he kept them. He actually took me to, with, 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 with him to the men. If I had been pushed toward children, I wouldn't be here today. So in a way, he actually saved my life. His story is a tragic and fascinating piece of history he is more than happy to tell. Just go ahead and ask him. What was your life like after the war? I'm not sure. I, I kind of like... It, it's something started and continued. Virgil Pincus currently resides at the Illinois Holocaust Museum in Skokie, the first place in the world to beta test New Dimensions in Testimony a seemingly living, breathing, Siri-like interactive program pioneered by the USC Shoah Foundation. All of the recording was done at the University of Southern California on a soundstage there. Over about 10 days of filming, he was asked roughly 2,000 different questions. There were 54 super high definition cameras pointed at him from every possible angle. There were thousands and thousands of LED lights. And the range of questions Pinkus can answer is astounding. What's your favorite food? I had a very healthy appetite, and I had everything. He speaks multiple languages. How many languages does he speak? Let's find out. How many languages do you speak? I speak Polish, I speak German, English, French. Sing us a song. Piano dzieci, piano dbogo, szczyczka i Right now, Pinkus is two-dimensional and answers questions delivered through a moderator and a microphone. Eventually going 3D, he will take questions from anyone around him, even the ones he's reluctant to answer. What do you think of rap music? I have no comment about rap music. But he has plenty to say about history, Nazi occupation, and his life. Stories which, with this technology, will live on long after Pincus. Understand that survivors are not going to be around much longer. Researchers are looking to record as many survivor stories as soon as possible. The plan is to capture about 10 stories in the new format covering a range of Holocaust experiences. Filming Guttar costs about a million dollars, and the university team estimates that it will cost at least $500,000 to record additional survivors. Our last two case studies are two of the best and more recent examples of combining all of the techniques we've talked about today to create one-of-a-kind educational experiences. The Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 was one of the most decisive battles of the First War of Scottish Independence and an iconic cornerstone in Scottish history. To commemorate the 700th anniversary of the battle, the Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Center opened last year in Stirling, Scotland. Created by UK-based Bright White Limited and Electrosonic, the visitor experience uses a combination of storytelling, personalized experiences, and technology to transport visitors back in time to the historic battle. Within the Prepare for Battle exhibition, visitors are placed right in the middle of the action. Standing shoulder to shoulder with warriors and weapons, guests not only learn about the medieval battle, but really experience the emotions of war as they duck long bow arrows shot across the space. Adjacent character stations provide background on 10 historical or generic fictional characters who played a part in the battle. The highlight of the experience is the battle room, where visitors can either choose to watch a 10 minute battle game or register in advance to participate in a 40 minute battle. The highlight of the experience is the battle room, where visitors can either choose to watch a 10-minute battle show or register in advance to participate in a 40-minute battle game. The highlight of the experience is the battle room, where get the highlight of the experience is the battle room, where visitors can either choose to watch a 10-minute battle show or register in advance to participate in a 40-minute battle game. Up to 30 visitors can take command of the knights and soldiers competing on the virtual battlefield, which is controlled by the battlemaster, who also offers strategic advice. The interactive elements of the game allow visitors to make battle decisions that will affect an army, as the conflict plays out via projected media on a massive topographical model of the sterling landscape. Through the use of gameplay, immersive environments, and cutting-edge media technology, the Visitor Center provides guests with a better understanding and appreciation of this historic event. Our last project takes a subject that students might traditionally find boring and turns it into an experience that is equally immersive, interactive, and personal. Edward Schlossberg and his team at ESI created the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate 
to celebrate the life of the popular Massachusetts Senator. The Center's Senate Immersion Module, or SIM, combines role-playing, technology, and interpersonal interaction within a full-scale replica of the Senate Chamber to bring the Senate to life for visitors in a very personal manner. Let's take a look. Senator Edward M. Kennedy's vision was to create a nonpartisan educational organization to be a center of learning about the Senate and its role in the nation and world. The Senate Immersion Module takes place in the Institute's full-scale recreation of the Senate Chamber. The sim is designed for middle and high school students as part of the Institute's daily programs. This immersive role-playing experience lets students explore both current issues of national interest and historic debates from the Senate's past. Using handheld tablets, students take on the role of a senator, create a profile, and learn about an issue. The technology updates and informs students throughout the activity. Students debate issues of importance to the nation today, such as immigration. They need to learn the American culture. They need to know how to speak the language. Historic sims, such as the Compromise of 1850, help students consider legislative accomplishments from the Senate's past. Students play an active role in the sim, gathering information to help make their voting decisions. In hearings, they immerse themselves in learning about and voting on provisions, amendments, national security, nominees, as Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, and the core issues under consideration that day. Allowing visas for only foreign work is not allowing for the American dream. The experience culminates in the Institute's recreated Senate chamber for final action and roll call vote. immersion module offers a unique and exciting opportunity for students to gain an active understanding of how our government works and to be reminded of the great things we can achieve when we all come to the table. With that we've come to an end of the tour of this year's projects, all of which are bold or tell an engaging story, are very personal in nature, immerse their audience, or employ magical techniques and technologies. My hope is that these projects inspire you as you think about your own facilities, your own projects and your own businesses. So the next time you're about to embark on a new endeavor, I hope that you remember the Carney attraction that inspired today's speech and then go out and find your own gorilla. Thank you very much.